Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to RSM's June 2021 VAT webinar, where we'll be covering the key VAT issues in the UK and around the world over the course of the next hour. Can I have the next slide, please? My name is Philip Munn, and I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleagues in RSM's VAT team, Sarah Halstead and Ian Carpenter. Sarah, Ian and I will be discussing what we believe are the key VAT issues for UK businesses in the UK and in those countries where UK businesses commonly trade. Before turning to the agenda for today, I wanted to touch on a couple of housekeeping points. First, I'm pleased to say that over 800 people have signed up to attend today's event. I dare say that this will include some VAT specialists, as well as those for whom VAT is just one of many responsibilities. Uh, with that in mind, it's worth noting that our presentation will be pitched at finance professionals with some VAT experience. Uh, in short, we'll try to avoid some jargon. Um, with so many people attending, I should also note um, that uh, we won't be able to take questions live during the presentation. Having said that, we do want to make this presentation interactive Therefore, I want to take a moment to explain how to ask questions as we go. If we have time, then we'll pick up your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, this slide should be a fairly accurate representation of your webinar screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can submit these questions by using the Q&A box in the right hand side of the screen, marked with a little red box. If it doesn't immediately show up, you can click the three dots button at the bottom of the screen on the right hand side and select Q&A as highlighted by the red arrows. Next slide. Brilliant. So on to the agenda. Um, the first two points on today's agenda focus on trade with the EU. Uh, Ian and I will consider the implications of changes to the EU's VAT regime for e-commerce, which is coming into effect next month. The second item considers the VAT treatment of some services provided between the UK and the EU, which are subject to unusual VAT rules, referred to as the use and enjoyment rules. Ian will then talk about recent case law affecting the VAT treatment of management charges, before Sarah deals with two recent VAT cases, Balhousie and Kingston Moorwood. Uh, I should add that the dangers of presenting a VAT webinar on recent VAT developments is that last minute additions are almost inevitable. Uh, this time round, we do have a few last minute additions to the agenda. Sarah will touch on these today, but if they prove to be interesting, we may cover these matters in more detail next time round. Right, I'm pleased to hand over now to Ian to discuss the EU's e-commerce package. Ian. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. What we're going to cover in this section is where we are now both for the GB and for Northern Ireland because they are different, which no doubt you'll have heard about in the press in relation to challenges such as getting sausages into Northern Ireland. But then we're also going to look and touch on the complexity that we know many of you will have experienced in selling goods into the EU since Brexit. Now we have returned to these concepts of imports and exports. We're also going to look at what people are doing to manage these complexities. And then Phil is going to take back over and consider the new e-commerce rules that are coming in from the 1st of July, which is going to throw the whole thing um, up in the air again. So let's start with the obvious. GB is now a third country. We are no longer part of the EU. That's not exactly news. What does that mean? It means that if a UK business imports goods into the EU with a value of greater than 22 euros, then currently VAT is payable. And you can see here the basis for accounting for VAT, what you need to include within that landed cost. You can also see that the import VAT is paid at the rate of the country that the goods are imported. The other point of complexity is that we have a rate for when import VAT is due, and then we have a different rate of 150 euros for when customs duty may be, may be due on those goods on import. And you can see at the bottom of the slide here that the rates for customs duty very much depend on the type of goods being imported and what the origin of, of those goods are. And that is an entire webinar all by itself. 
but you can see that the rates of customs duty can be can, you know, quite high at 12% and that the rates of customs duty are always a cost. Next slide, please, Sarah. So that's a starting point of where we are in relation to the EU. So what about Northern Ireland? Northern Ireland is effectively a foot in both camps, in the EU and in the UK. On one hand, a GB seller selling goods into a business or an individual into Northern Ireland will charge UK VAT. But we will come on to customs duty and customs duty declarations in a second. But Northern Ireland is also subject to the EU VAT rules. And you can, hear, you can see here some of the anomalies that that brings. Low value consignment relief, which isn't available in the UK, is available in Northern Ireland currently. And Northern Ireland is still within the EU distance selling regime. Next slide, please, Sarah. And whilst I've mentioned the previous slide that Northern Ireland is regarded as part of the UK in respect of VAT, there are obligations in, re in relation to customs duty and customs declarations. Whilst there shouldn't be any customs duty declarations required for goods valued under £135, there are simplified customs declarations still required for most goods greater than £135 in value. EU tariffs may currently be payable for at-risk goods such as agriculture, civil explosives and the one I personally like most, invasive alien species, which just reminded me of UFOs. We have a grace period in relation to this lighter touch for customs checks and, and customs declarations until October this year. And the changes and new policies are still being negotiated be between the parties. But I think as there's already been agreement in relation to um, the declarations between GB and the UK, we are expecting some form of delay um, in respect of when those lighter touch customs checks will, will end. Next slide again, Sarah, please. So that's Northern Ireland. Let's turn to the commercial challenges for GB online sellers selling into the EU. As many of you will know, pre-Brexit, UK businesses could sell goods to customers in the EU, and either those goods would be subject to UK VAT or they would be subject to local VAT under the distance selling rules. The rules were well known and they were relatively simple in, you know, in hindsight and quite obviously there weren't any customs declarations. If you look now at the position, it's a lot more complicated. We have customs declarations, then we have clearing charges. So we now have additional costs, additional paperwork and friction slowing down those sales. This can lead to an impact on customer satisfaction if they are not receiving their goods in a manner that they had previously been expecting, which has become a real headache for many businesses. There are also other issues such as return goods, which I will come on to in a bit. Next slide, please, Sarah. So let's turn to how some UK businesses have approached these challenges. One option is what you might call the EU VAT registration model. You can see here, a UK business imports the goods into the EU. It has a VAT registration requirement. It then accounts for VAT on the sale and recovers the import VAT. It will pay customs duty if applicable, which will be a cost as I explained earlier. So from a customer's experience perspective, they are being charged local VAT in the same way that they would be charged if they were buying those goods from an EU business in that territory. However, for a UK business, this route leads to the requirements to have multiple VAT registrations and additional compliance costs, as well as the costs that I previously showed you in relation to you know, the cost of importing into the EU. So cost basis hireage, which is a common theme for the, you know, for all of the examples I'm going to show you. If we turn on to the next slide and the DAP plus model. Now, the DAP plus is a commercial term. DAP means delivered at place, being an INCO term for the movement of freight. And what that means is it becomes the EU end customer who is regarded as the importer, but it is the seller who pays the import VAT and the import duty on their behalf. Next slide, please, Sarah. We have found that the DAP plus model has been an option that's been taken up by quite a few UK businesses in advance of the July changes that I said Phil will talk about in a bit. 
So why have UK businesses been adopting the DAP plus model? Well, first it removes the obligation for the GB seller to have an EU VAT registration. So that's one cost being reduced. It is the customer which is named as the import and not the seller. And the UK VAT and duties are paid by the parcel carrier upon import and then recharged back to the seller. Again, next slide, please, Sarah. From a customer's perspective, they get their goods without the shipper knocking on the door, requiring payment of the import VAT and the import duty, if applicable. It also allows sellers to incorporate all fees within the landed costs of goods at the online checkout, so the customer knows exactly what they are paying. So again, going back to that customer experience and a reason why it's been adopted by a number of UK businesses. But it does have its challenges. In particular, return when particular when a customer returns goods. If the customer decides to return the goods, it's virtually impossible for the seller to reclaim the VAT and duty, the EU VAT and duty, because it is the customer who has been named as the importer. UK VAT and duty may also be payable on the re-import into the UK, although there may be options to alleviate these costs by utilising returns goods relief. Next slide, please, Sarah. So let's turn to one of the other models that businesses have been adopting, and that is to move stock into the EU. This leads to, again, a, a VAT registration requirement in the country of import. And we've seen Netherlands and Belgium as being probably the two main preferred territories for businesses that have adopted uh, this route. The goods are then in free circulation in the EU, and the seller can then rely on the current, again, um, distance selling rules until the 1st of July, when we move into this entirely new landscape where the e-commerce changes, which Phil is now going to cover, take over. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Ian. Um, can I have the next slide? Oh, there it is. Um, so, what are the changes? Um, I should start by saying that uh, many EU member states have not published the relevant legislation or guidance on these changes. Um, nor have they created the registration portals that I'll talk about in a moment for affected organisations. Um, nonetheless, it's clear that it will become an obligation from the 1st of July to account for that under these new schemes. Uh, therefore, it's important to understand the principles and some of the high level implications. Um, and I'd recommend that you speak to your usual RSM conduct if, you, if you've got particularly detailed issues about individual member states. So, as Ian mentioned, the EU changes are designed to ensure that VAT is collected in the place in which the consumer belongs. And to make the compliance with this obligation um, a little bit more straightforward um, than it is at the moment, uh, which is, as Ian has already explained, pretty complicated. Um, the way they do this is by extending what they've, uh, uh, a mechanism they've used for some years now, the one-stop shop to create a single VAT registration, a single VAT return, um, to account for output tax or, or local VAT uh, anywhere in the EU on a single registration. So instead of submitting VAT returns for each and individual member state where you have customers, a single VAT return is all that you need. Um, in principle then, it's a relatively straightforward uh, approach and in the EU's mind at least, uh, will reduce the incidence of uh, non-EU traders selling goods to EU consumers with no VAT on them at all. And, and that is something that they're very keen to uh, cut down on. So with that in mind, um, there are three different elements to this scheme, which I've listed in green on the slide here. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the non-EU uh, scheme for service providers. So for those of you that are affected by this, you'll be familiar that the existing uh, mini one-stop shop um, covers the provision of services from a non-EU business to an EU consumer, but only if those services are of telecommunications, broadcasting, um, or electronically supplied services, or TBE as they used to be called. There are, of course, many incidences where services are taxed in the EU when they're provided to private individuals um, on a country by country basis. And 
Um, so the scheme has been extended to include all services um, that are subject to EU VAT in different member states. So one example might be um, land related services. So if you're an estate agent that is involved in selling homes throughout the EU, um, then your services will be taxed wherever the property belongs, rather than having to VAT register in every single member state where you sell a property, you'll have a single VAT registration and a single uh, place to account for your EU VAT. Um, second, uh, for EU organisations, the VAT distance selling regime will come to an end. So for those businesses that are familiar with this, um, it used to be the case when we were part of the EU, that a UK business, if it, it breached a particular threshold, um, then it would be obliged to start charging the local VAT on the sale of goods. Um, that um, distance selling regime will come to an end uh, and will be replaced by a one-stop shop system that encompasses all goods and services. Um, and there is a threshold for this um, to help micro businesses. Um, unfortunately, the threshold is only 10,000 euros. So if you do have an EU business um, that is selling goods and services across the EU, uh, if, that, uh, if that is less than 10,000 euros, you can continue to charge local EU VAT. If it is above that threshold, then I'm afraid uh, the new union scheme will bite and local VAT will become due. Um, third, and arguably the most complex um, scheme, um, is referred to as on this slide as the import scheme. So the import scheme, as the name suggests, only affects goods. And it affects any goods that are coming from outside of the EU to an EU consumer. Okay, so even if it is a an EU business, if those goods are entering the EU um, for delivery to a consumer and the value of the consignment is less than 150 euros, um, then you might choose to register under the import one-stop shop scheme. Um, now for non-EU businesses uh, that uh, opt to use the import scheme, um, they, they must appoint in most member states an intermediary. An intermediary will be the, uh, a local representative that is responsible for submitting and paying the VAT due under the import one-stop shop scheme. For those few com countries that have mentioned it, it, it seems clear that UK businesses uh, will be obliged to appoint an intermediary. There was some hope that UK businesses would be immune from this requirement because of the terms of the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, unfortunately, um, it seems increasingly clear um, that the trade and cooperation agreement does not cover this intermediary ob obligation. Um, if you choose not to use the import one stop shop scheme, um, there are still some of those options that Ian has already mentioned, uh, including the DAP plus model. And that is certainly um, one of those two options is likely to be uh, quite commonly adopted, particularly in the, over the course of the next few months, where there is still some um, organisation required in some member states to facilitate the establishment of the import scheme. One thing that I'm not going to have time to cover in any detail today uh, are the changes for online marketplaces, simply because there's too little time. Um, but suffice to say that any business involved in the facilitation of the sale of goods via the internet um, Amazon's marketplace uh, is the most commonly cited example, uh, will be treated as though they have bought the goods in question from the supplier and sold those goods to the consumer. So in, as far as the VAT man is concerned, it is Amazon, in the case of uh, Amazon, that will be um, selling the goods to the end consumer in the EU. Um, if your organisation facilitates such sales, or you sell via a platform that could be regarded as a facilitator, but you're not quite sure of the particular requirements of a facilitator for this online marketplace change, um, then we would recommend that you um, consider these changes in a little bit more detail. Um, and as usual, do contact your usual RSM contact. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, one of the points that um, Ian mentioned um, uh, on the on his slides uh, was the fact that um, some uh, UK businesses in preparation for uh, Brexit were establishing some form of distribution hub uh, within the EU. And you know, when I went through the changes a moment ago, uh, you might have got the sense that 
and perhaps not surprisingly, it is far easier um, for uh, businesses to trade within the EU um, than for businesses to trade out from from outside of the EU by bringing goods into the EU. Um, so, you know, suffice to say, um, the new scheme does um, make allowance for those situations where you have a non-EU established seller that has some inventory stored in a warehouse in, let's say, the Netherlands, Belgium, one of those typical uh, countries that you would expect to be used for those things. Um, the, there are a couple of things to, to mention about this. If you have no establishment in the EU, um, but you wish to register the union scheme and therefore account for local EU VAT via the much more simplified process available to uh, union goods, um, you've got to register for, it, for that in the EU member state where the goods are sold or transported from. Um, so uh, that narrows your flexibility a little bit because, as I mentioned a moment ago, some EU member states are interpreting the rules and requirements slightly differently. Um, nonetheless, um, there are uh, it, it is overall a more simple, simplified scheme. Um, the other point that I've got on this slide here is that the stock needs to be held in the EU. So it, it cannot be the case that you, um, you know, sell goods uh, from outside of the EU uh, and bring them into the EU and then and then use the union scheme. The, it's the start of the um, sale process where the goods are when they are sold. That is the key bit. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the import one stop shop is a um, a voluntary scheme. You can either choose to choose to use the import one stop shop to account for your local VAT. You can use the DAP plus model, which Ian explained a moment ago, um, or you can ask your customer to pay the import VAT and duty prior to them receiving the goods in question. Those are the typical options that are considered if you choose not to have some kind of an EU distribution model. So what are the, if you like, benefits, the things to think about uh, before registering for the import one-stop shop? Um, well, the first thing, uh, if I start on the top left of this slide, higher tariffs charged by fast parcel carriers. Uh, what is clear in the discussions that we've been having with um, freight forwarders is that um, at uh, it's quite often the case that a, a fast parcel carrier um, will not adopt the most VAT and duty efficient means of getting goods from the UK into the EU. That might mean that they inadvertently pay or suffer higher tariffs um, than would be the case if you were registered under the uh, uh, import one-stop shop. So um, there's certainly something to think about there and perhaps talk to your uh, fast parcel carriers about um, if you're thinking about adopting the DAP plus model um, and you don't necessarily uh, want to, to offer two or three day shipment terms. Um, so if we go then down to the bottom left, cost of appointing an EU intermediary, um, it is clear that there are only very few intermediaries capable of acting on behalf of, um, in most member states, um, a, a UK business or any non-EU EU business, um, there are very few of them in the EU at the moment. And that's partly because the rules determining what their obligations are, are not particularly clear. Um, however, what is clear is that there will be probably some obligation to have a bank guarantee of some form, but what value that might be is not yet clear. Um, so the cost of appointing one of those EU intermediaries, if you elect for the import one-stop shop um, is likely to be quite high. Um, we've talked about the fact that there's no import back for goods under that uh, 150 uh, euro uh, value. Um, and Ian has already touched upon uh, Northern Ireland. Um, what we say here is that the HMRC are in a bit of an awkward position uh, as regards to these particular changes. It is clear uh, because of Northern Ireland protocol that HMRC has the obligation to adopt these EU VAT package rules. And there will be a UK import one-stop shop established um, for Northern Ireland. Um, unfortunately, at this point, like many other, uh, well, like many EU member states, the details of that are not yet clear. Um, 
I've touched upon the online marketplace rules. I won't say anything think more about that. Um, and I just want to sort of make the point that with the import one stop shop, goods can be imported into any EU member state. So if we go on to the next slide. So I've said quite a lot about um, the EU and the EU rules. Um, I'm going to stay with the EU just for a little while longer um, and talk about the use and enjoyment rules. Now, the use and enjoyment rules only apply to services rather than goods. So if we go on to the next slide. So um, what is use and enjoyment? Well, as I mentioned before, um, these are rules which affect the place of supply um, at the, at, at, in essentially where VAT should be accounted for. Now, uh, by default, um, many businesses that will be familiar with uh, international trade of services um, will know that for the sale between B2B or, or for one business sells to another business, um, quite often um, those services will be treated as being outside the scope of VAT of the supplier business uh, and might be subject to a reverse charge wherever the customer belongs. So there are no VAT registration or particular VAT sticking costs in those situations. Um, by contrast, um, supplies from a business to a customer are often subject to VAT wherever the supplier belongs, but that's probably another, another tale for another day. Um, there are, of course, this is, this is VAT, this is tax, there are always exceptions to the normal rule, and the use and enjoyment rules are one of the exceptions to the rule. Um, in this particular case, um, the use and enjoyment rules stipulate that particular services in particular member states uh, will be subject to local VAT if those services are used and enjoyed in that member state. So there are a couple of qualifications to this particular rule. The first off is that not all member states have uh, uh, opted to use the use and enjoyment rules. Uh, the UK has use and enjoyment rules and about 11 EU member states have use and enjoyment rules. As you can probably guess from this slide, Spain is one of those countries that has opted to have um, use and enjoyment rules as well. The use and enjoyment rules are there to ensure that if services are used in the EU, they are subject to EU VAT. However, they only kick in in those circumstances uh, where the recipient cu customer uh, is outside of the EU and therefore they might ordinarily be outside the scope of EU VAT. Now, of course, up until the end of last year, the UK was part of the EU. Uh, and that means that for many UK businesses for the first time, um, EU suppliers are charging local VAT on their supplies under what's called these use and enjoyment rules. Um, I want to give uh, an example on this to just sort of, uh, it, it, you know, explain it a little bit more. So in this example, you can see on the right hand side of your screen here, uh, we've got a Spanish supplier of advertising services. And that Spanish supplier of advertising services um, has, is producing an, an advertising campaign which is targeting Spanish consumers. In this slide, uh, they're the users of the service, or they, they are the where the use and enjoyment happens. That's in Spain. The person that's commissioning this work happens to be in the UK. Prior to Brexit, outside the scope of Spanish VAT, subject to the reverse charge in the UK. Since Brexit, what we're finding is many advertisers in Spain are beginning to charge Spanish VAT to their UK customers. And as you can imagine, um, this is causing some consternation because in a sense, their services have suddenly become 20% or so more expensive than they were previously. So if we go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I've used an example there of Spain and advertising services, but the scope of the use and enjoyment rules is uh, at the discretion of every single member state. Um, Spain is a particular one that has cropped up quite often recently. Um, we're also aware of rules in uh, Denmark, which are a little bit more far reaching. Um, in many of the other member states, uh, the use and enjoyment rules are limited to things like um, transportation services. So those are what might be regarded, Spain and Denmark, I think, would be regarded as the more high risk jurisdictions. Um, I should say something else as well um, before we move on. The Spanish rules do not affect UK VAT rules. 
So it is quite possible that you will receive a, a charge from Spain, from a Spanish advertising company with Spanish VAT on. Um, it's, it is still subject to UK VAT under the reverse charge, which means that for those businesses that are not entitled to recover all the VAT they incur on their costs, there might be double taxation. Um, use and John also, also um, ignore um, physical. So, so it's not a case that um, the UK business has some Spanish establishment which is regarded as being the recipient of the supply. This is a, a, a purely look through, a very academic test of where those services are used and enjoyed. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the UK also has use and enjoyment rules. So for some services, uh, telecommunications, electronically supplied services, um, UK suppliers must go through the same thought process. But of course, for UK supplier, any customer outside of the UK potentially becomes subject to these use and enjoyment rules and brings those supplies within the scope of the uh, UK VAT for the first time. So come on to the next slide. So what happens um, if your EU supplier suddenly starts charging you local VAT? So I think the first point here is to just check with them. Ask them why they're charging you local VAT. It is quite possible it's just an error uh, and that they didn't do it uh, deliberately. Of course, what might happen is they say, no, actually, we did charge you VAT deliberately. It's because of these use and enjoyment rules and we haven't charged you that in the past because you used to be part of the EU. The next thing to check um, is whether you're entitled to reclaim that VAT via the 13th Directive. Um, as you might imagine, the 13th Directive scheme, which is available to non-EU businesses, including the UK, to recover EU VAT, um, there are, it is a far more restrictive regime than anybody that's tried to use the Electronic Refund Directive will be used to. So um, it is quite possible um, that some member states will refuse to pay uh, their local VAT back to a UK business, uh, in particular because some member states insist that there is a reciprocity agreement in place and the trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK does not cover that reciprocity. Um, the final point that I've got on this slide here is restructuring. Um, and by restructuring, um, I, I want to make it very clear that I don't mean some paper exercise which ensures that the Spanish supplier in the previous example suddenly charges their services to a French customer instead of a UK customer, and then that French customer passes the charge on. This has to be a situation where the role of the French company, in my example here on the right hand side of the screen, actually has a task to fulfill and consumes the services of the Spanish supplier. Um, it is uh, essential um, that that French company has a role in that process and that whatever charge that French company then makes to the UK company reflects that role and the additional work that it's done prior to charging uh, to the uh, UK end consumer in, in this particular case. So um, there are other restructuring uh, approaches that might be adopted. I've, I've chosen one here um, simply because uh, we haven't come across French uh, French businesses charging French VAT under the use and enjoyment rules, and we don't believe that there is any particular risk associated with that. So uh, if we could go on to the next slide, I think that's it on use and enjoyment. And I'm now very pleased to hand over to Mr. Carpenter uh, to talk about management charges. Thank you again, Phil. As Phil says, I'm now going to turn to management charges as there have been a couple of recent court decisions which have highlighted again the importance of looking at management charges or recharges between groups of companies and where well, you have a holding company in terms of whether they are eligible to be registered for VAT and recover VAT. Sarah, can you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'd like to start off with by saying we won't be covering any new ground here. But we do think that these cases are a timely reminder of the issues that businesses face with management charges and the potential costs of not looking at this area in detail. The key accounting for VAT issues here are if there is no supply, is the holding company or the entity entitled to recover VAT on its costs? Is it entitled to be VAT registered? 
and where there is a supply and that supply side, i.e. so there is a charge being made and there is a value being put on that charge, is it at the right level? That's particularly relevant where the receiving entity is connected and is unable to recover some or all of its VAT. You can see from the fact that we have a number of cases, which I'm going to go through, and from our own experience, that this remains a significant area of focus and source of revenue for HMRC. I think the problem is that these recharges, management charges, are often not either recognised or not given the same rigour because they are intercompany charges um, in comparison to when, say, a business has an external customer. But they are important in some ways to treat as almost if they, they were an external customer. And again, I'll come on to that at the moment. So let's look at the, the recent cases. So, sorry, if you can move on to the next slide, please. The first is tower resources, which is this issue of, of holding companies and whether it's entitled to recover VAT. And the other one is Jupiter Asset Management, where the issue was, what was the correct value of the management charges that it was providing? I'm going to start off with tower resources. Thank you, Sarah. Tower Resources, as you can see here, is an AIM-listed holding company and it owns subsidiaries which explore for and produces oil in various countries. Each subsidiary has its own board of directors, including the Tower CEO, and it has offices and management in that country in question. Tower Resources provided loans and services to the subsidiaries, such as geological, geophysical and seismic data acquisition services, but also loans to fund the subsidiary's costs while it explored for oil in that territory. From Tower Resources' perspective, it believed it was making supplies of management charges and loans to its subsidiaries, and it regarded those supplies as outside the scope of VAT slash specified exempt supplies being the loans to an entity at that point outside of the EU. And and that meant, from Tower's perspective, it had the ability to recover VAT on its UK costs. Sarah, next slide, please. The charges made to the subsidiaries were accounted for by adding the sums to the intercompany loans. And these were initially recharged at cost, but since 2015, they have been subject to a markup of 5%. You can also see here, initially, there were no written agreements between the parties but such agreements were created in 2015. Now that may have been off the back of a, of a case that came out before then, uh, which some of you may recall, Norseman Gold, where the lack of contracts was a contributing factor in the tribunal finding that there was no supply in relation to Norseman Gold's activities. You can also see here, the agreements provided for Tower to be paid on the last business day of each year, and the loan agreements to include, to include the stipulation that the loans were payable on demand. HMRC carried out a VAT inspection in 20, 2008 and 2014, but on those, both of those visits failed to understand that it was the subsidiaries that undertook the exploration, not Tower itself. In 2015, in another VAT inspection, HMRC realised the correct supply chain, and they took the view that Tower was not making supplies for a consideration, or if it was, it was not an economic activity. In 2016, it raised assessments totally in 1.45 million. Again, it, this it raises the point that I think is always worth bearing in mind that just because you've had a VAT inspection doesn't mean everything is okay, as HMRC can seek to recover VAT if they later believe they have made an error or have misunderstood the situation. Next slide, please, Sarah. Some of you may be thinking, haven't we been here before? And you're right. This case originally stems from 2019, where the first tier tribunal found in favour of Tower. So let's look first at what the first tier tribunal found. Although there were no written agreements before 2015, agreements did exist, big tick, uh, between Tower and its subsidiaries, under which Tower provided services and met the expenses of the subsidiary for which they charged for by adding to the intercompany loan. The tribunal also found that the circumstances could be distinguished from that earlier case, Norseman Gold, that I mentioned, where in that case there was a rather vague intention to levy unspecified charges at some undefined point of, in the future, 
and the FTC rejected HMRC's contention that there was a matter of economic reality, that there was no obligation for the subsidiary to repay. Next slide, please, Sarah. HMRC lost at the first tier tribunal, and the reason why we're talking about this case again is because they appealed it to the upper tribunal, where they have lost again. But it doesn't take away from the fact that this is an area that they are looking at in detail. So let's look at what HMRC argued at the upper tribunal. Mainly that despite the written agreements that there was in place, there was a HMRC believed that there was a common understanding between Tower and its subsidiaries that Tower would not demand payment unless the subsidiary had funds to pay Tower. From HMRC perspective, if this was true, it would break the required direct link between the supply, the service that being provided, and the consideration stroke payment, which needed to be paid. And if that was correct, that would mean that there was no taxable supply, as a result of which, in HMRC's view, Tower would not be entitled to recover its VAT. The Upper Tribunal has rejected this argument. There was nothing in, in the agreements to indicate VAT should be determined solely in relation to a practice, and the Upper Tribunal thought it would be unworkable for a VAT position to depend on the subjective and possibly changeable conduct of one of the parties. The key point here is that the Tribunal returned to the now very familiar theme that it is the contract that will be the primary way of determining VAT. Unless there is clear evidence that that contract is a sham. So that's always really important to bear in mind. And that for me is the key learning coming out of the Tower Resources case, that if you have a holding company that is that you believe is making supplies to other entities, and it's relying on the fact it's making those supplies to other entities, um, to entitle it to recover VAT, we would advise you to look at those agreements in detail to make sure that they clearly and robustly set out the services to be provided, the fees to be charged, and the payment terms. They are all crucially important. And the other, just other point, just outside of the Tower case, but still relating to holding companies, there is still, I think, a, a feeling that if you were to add a holding company to a VAT group that would, if the VAT group was fully taxable, give you a right to recover all of your VAT, even though it might be holding company VAT. And we just say, just like to challenge that assumption, not saying it's completely wrong, but I'm definitely not saying that's completely right. So let's turn now to Jupiter Asset Management. Um, many of you may have even heard of this business. You know, JAM or Jupiter Asset Management is a fund management business. It is part of a large corporate group, which has two separate group registrations, Jupiter Asset Management, which I've mentioned, and Jupiter Investment Management. And these were known as JAM and JIM. And you can see in this case, we do have contracts, we do have defined supplies, and we do have consideration. Because you can see that JAM provided management services to members of the Jim Vat group, which was supplied under an MSA. And you can see the type of services that were being provided. The issue here was not about whether the services were being provided, although there is a little bit about that in, in this point, but whether the amounts charged from Jam to Jim was correct. Was it at a high enough level? Next slide, please, Sarah. In 2014, HMRC challenged JAM's input tax recovery, arguing it is not entitled to recover VAT on its costs, or in the alternative, it had undervalued the management charge to Jim, which we assume being in financial services was not entitled to recover some or all of its VAT. HMRC issued two assessments, the first being an open market direction for 2 million, i.e. what it thought was the correct value of the management services should be. It also raised a separate assessment I think from 1 million to disallow the input tax recovery on JAM's costs. After the European Court judgment in the cases of Laurentia and Minervia in 2015, HMRC determined that the open market value assessment, i.e. the 2 million, the higher number, was its preferred assessment when it was taking the case to the court, or actually responding to the, the, the um, appeal from, from JAM. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. 
Thank you. So let's look at what the first GI tier tribunal has found. You can see here the tribunal was found in favour of HMRC on the, on the open market issue. The court found that in order to ascertain the open market value of the supply, it is necessary to identify the consideration that would have passed between Jam and Jim if they have not had been connected. And that created a real issue. The fact that the very nature of management services provided within the same corporate group meant it was very difficult to ascertain what would be a comparable transaction between unconnected parties. Therefore, the value of the management charges should be no less than the full cost of to Jam of providing the management services to Jim. Jam put forward to the court that the correct approach was to look at the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. But this was rejected by the tribunal because the tribunal found that it was only relevant to direct tax and does not apply to the determination of open market value for VAT purposes, which from a VAT geek's point of view is quite an interesting development because although we have recognised that there is no direct correlation, we have always felt that transfer pricing guidelines and transfer pricing approach would at least be indicative of what an open market value may be for VAT. But if you take the first tier tribunal's logic, that may not be the case. Next slide, please, Sarah. This meant that the tribunal had to determine the full cost of or incurred by JAM in providing its services to Jim. And you can see here that not only did the FTT decide it was the VAT bearing costs that had to be taken into consideration, but also the non VAT bearing costs incurred by JAM in providing its services to Jim. In essence, the tribunal, whilst accepting the complexities, preferred HMRC's methodology to JAM's methodology and upheld HMRC's assessment. Now, given the amounts involved and the complexities here, we really wouldn't be surprised if JAM appeals. And therefore, on a later webinar, I or one of my colleagues may be take, talking about this case again. The point that it does raise is where you are making or recharging any services to a connected party and that connected party cannot recover VAT, then it is important to look at the value of those supplies. Otherwise, if those supplies are undervalued, there is a significant risk that HMRC will issue an open market direction as they did here and look to raise an assessment, penalties and interest. Now that's just two of the, of, of the cases that have come out recently, both focused on management charges. I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who is going to look at some of the other recent developments. Well, thank you very much, Ian, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, so um, we have two other important VAT cases to talk about this time. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Balhousy Holdings, which is a decision from the Supreme Court on land and property. Uh, this case is of interest to owners and users of new charity buildings or relevant residential properties, which are el eligible for the zero rate VAT relief at the time they're completed. But this zero rate, of course, is important because it's a major benefit for most of these organisations because they're not normally entitled to fully recover that on new buildings. But if you do claim this relief, you've got to be wary of a self-supply charge which can retrospectively reduce or eliminate the VAT savings if you dispose of the building or change its use within 10 years. Now, Balhousie is actually a favourable judgment from the UK Supreme Court regarding one potential trigger of this self-supply charge. It's good news because it potentially allows these organisations to use leaseback arrangements to finance new charitable or residential buildings such as care homes or accommodation for students without use, losing the VAT reliefs on their construction or acquisition. Now, to give you some background about this case, um, Balhousie Care operates a cha chain of residential care homes in Scotland. It acquired a new building free of VAT by issuing a certificate confirming its intention to use the property as a care home, i.e. for a relevant residential purpose, so it qualified for the zero rating. To raise funds to acquire the new building, Balhousie entered into a sale and leaseback arrangement with a real estate investment trust, under which it sold this care home, along with two others that it owned, to the trust. 
which simultaneously granted 30-year leases back to Balhousie, and Balhousie continued to use all three properties as care homes. This led to a dispute with HMRC, which thought the arrangement meant that Balhousie was liable to the self-supply VAT charge. And HMRC took the view that um, Balhousie had disposed of its entire interest in the new building at the sales stage before it received the lease back and it assessed Balhousie for VAT of £800,000. Balhousie appealed, arguing that the lease and lease back did not amount to a disposal of the care home. So on 31st of March this year, um, Balhousie, the Supreme Court unanimously found in favour of Balhousie, uh, agreeing that it wasn't liable to this VAT charge because it hadn't disposed of its entire interest in the care home. And here are some key points from the decision. Um, while it had sold its... Um, the reasoning of the majority of the judges was that the VAT charge applied only when the taxpayer was left with no interest at all in the property. Balhousie had sold its freehold interest in the building, but it had simultaneously taken back a leasehold interest. So there was effectively no moment in time during that sale and leaseback transaction where Balhousie did not have an interest in the property. And um, this really is an important decision because now it's been decided by the Supreme Court, HMRC can't appeal further. It's now settled case law that this type of transaction won't give rise to a self-supply charge on a business, uh, a building used for a relevant residential or charitable purpose. But the judgment is complex and we don't yet have a statement from HMRC on it, how it's going to work in practice for other organisations in similar circumstances, i.e. the hoops that you'll need to jump through to make sure uh, that you can uh, keep your zero rating. But we do understand from HMRC that a business brief will be published soon on this topic. While we're waiting for that, charities, care homes, schools and universities, anyone who uses relevant uh, residential or charity buildings um, should take a look at the Balhousie decision and have a, just have a think about how it could work for them, how they could use this to structure a lease back contract without triggering the self supply charge. And also it's important to add that apart from um, leaseback transactions, there's plenty of other ways you could uh, trigger a self-supply charge. If you, your organisation has benefited from this zero rate relief on this type of building in the last 10 years, you always need to consider the VAT impact of any intended disposal um, of the property or the business, even if the physical use of the property doesn't change. Um, a couple of examples on the screen there would be sale of a care home from one care home operator to another or transfer of a care home business that includes the building. They are potential triggers of a, um, a self-supply charge as well. So really it's an important reminder to organisations that have taken advantage of this VAT zero rating on charity or um, residential buildings that a 10 year period exists during which HMRC can claw back a proportion of the VAT saving if the taxpayer um, disposes of its interest in the property or changes the use of the building. And it can be also all too easy to uh, trigger this self supply charge. So VAT should always be considered when you're changing your arrangements on these buildings. Right, the other case that I wanted to talk about um, this time is Kingston Moor Ward College and this revisits issues that were raised in an, a tribunal decision in Colchester Institute which we talked about on the last webinar in March on the back position of grant funded education. Um, so we've had some further developments um, but before I launch into them I'm just going to quickly recap the findings in Colchester. So Colchester is a further education college that provides government uh, funded education to 16 to 19 year olds. The upper tribunal unexpectedly found this year that the, um, the grant funding is business income for VAT purposes and Colchester had actually argued this in the hope that it would support a particular VAT arrangement that it had. Um, the ruling contradicts HMRC's long-standing position that this is non-business income um, and that is also the treatment that's supplied by the vast majority of further education colleges and if this um, upper tribunal decision in Colchester were enforced it jeopardises colleges entitlement to charitable VAT reliefs which were based on the fact that most of their income is non-business and that includes zero rating of construction of new buildings and also the 5% reduced VAT rate on fuel and power so those are quite valuable um, 
valuable concessions there that uh, I've now been put at risk. So in general, this decision is very bad news for FE colleges because far more of them are relying on the charitable status to support their VAT um, than actually stand to benefit from their grant income being treated as, as business. And the decision also has potential to um, apply to other education providers like academies and maybe even to other re recipients of um, central grant funding like hospices. So this is a decision that we're very much watching. Um, so these are the latest developments. Um, I'm just going to skip through this because I, I see that we're um, getting a little short on time. But in Kingston Moor Ward, um, once again, uh, the tribunal was pretty much obliged to apply the decision of the upper tribunal in Colchester that its government grant funding was non-business. Um, because that decision came from a superior court and it's binding on the first tier tribunal. And Kingston Moorward is important, not because it's different from Colchester, but because the, the tribunal's decision was pretty much the same. It's a strong indication that Colchester was not decided on any unique fact, fact pattern and that tribunals are all too ready to rule that grant funded education by um, lots of different types of FE colleges can be a business supply. Um, the good news that we have is a revenue and customs brief has been issued giving a statement from HMRC on its position after the Colchester decision. HMRC says it disagrees with the tribunal's finding that grant funded further education is a business activity. It's not going to appeal the Colchester decision, but it's going to challenge this particular finding under a new appeal. And we're waiting to find out the name of that new case. But in the meantime, HMRC's policy on grant funded education is going to remain unchanged. It will not impose business treatment on any further education institution. Colleges may continue to treat such education as non-business and claim their charitable reliefs. Colleges can also um, choose to apply the business treatment if they wish, but HMRC says it's going to protect its position until the litigation is finished. So um, a quick reaction to this. Um, it is good news for most colleges and it gives them some important breathing space after this unwelcome decision that came from Colchester. Um, colleges can keep claiming their VAT reliefs for now without the risk of HMRC assessments and hopefully the HMRC's statement means that it, it aims to preserve these reliefs for colleges in the long term. Um, HMRC has for the time being given FE colleges a choice to decide whether to treat their government grant income as business or non-business. Um, from the vast majority of colleges, as we said, sticking to the non-business treatment is going to be the best approach, but there is also an option for any for whom it might be favourable to treat the grant income as business to submit a back claim to HMRC. But overall, the brief is welcome, It's un but it would be unwise for um, colleges to see it as a green light for their VAT treatment. Proceed with caution if you're considering expensive capital spends and just take this hiatus as an opportunity to work out the cost if HMRC is eventually forced to implement Colchester at some point. Right, as Phil said earlier, VAT being VAT, it's a fast moving tax and there's always some more news that pops out. Um, uh, in between us finalising our slides and actually getting to present to you. So firstly, the Court of Appeal has issued its ruling in Royal Opera House concerning the attribution of input tax for partial exemption purposes. Essentially, it's found in favour of HMRC that the Opera House's production costs do not have a link to the taxable supplies from its restaurants and bars, therefore refusing a claim for additional VAT recovery. We also have a judgment from the European Court on Financial Services Matters in the joint cases of K and DB CAG. The courts found there that the particular um, third party outsourced services can benefit from the VAT exemption for management of special investment funds. We'll look at those two decisions in more depth and um, with a view to giving them full coverage on the next webinar in September. And finally, an important update on the COVID-19 VAT deferral which allowed businesses to defer payments, uh, VAT payments for a period of time last year. The deadline for opting into HMRC's new payment scheme to settle this um, arrears by direct debit has now passed. 
Um, and HMRC has updated its web page setting out how businesses should now repay this deferred VAT. HMRC says that you should contact them um, on the COVID-19 helpline if you haven't yet paid the VAT or you didn't join the online payment scheme by the deadline of 21st uh, of June 2021. If you haven't done either of those things, you need to contact HMRC's helpline um, to either pay your deferred VAT in full or to make a bespoke time to pay agreement with HMRC. And your deadline for doing this is the 30th of June 2021. Um, anyone who hasn't done this is potentially liable to a 5% penalty or interest. Um, so it is important to take action on your deferred VAT if you haven't already done so. So that is the last of today's presentations and I will now hand back to Phil um, to look at some questions since the uh, webinar began. Thanks Sarah. Um, well I'm, I'm afraid we've sort of run out of time to answer the questions but I'm just looking down the list at the moment. Um, I can confirm that we will be sending a recording of uh, today's presentation to all of those that signed up. Um, so, and uh, if you don't get the recording because it's hit the firewall or something like that, please do contact your usual RSM person and we'll be able to get hold of a copy for you uh, if you need them. Um, the only other one I've got time for is uh, on, on coffee. Um, I can confirm that I just had a quick look on the European uh, Union's website. Um, it looks like uh, the VAT rate for foodstuffs varies across all member states, I can see rates from 25% all the way down to uh, 4% in front of me at the moment. And I'm afraid I couldn't tell you uh, offhand which rate will apply on which country. Um, and for those of you that do have other questions, um, what we will be doing is we'll be passing those questions on to your usual contact person and they might contact you uh, separately after this presentation. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I just want to spend a couple of seconds talking about um, upcoming events. So the next VAT webinar uh, is scheduled, pencil it into the calendars now for the 23rd of September, 2021. Um, I also wanted to mention other uh, webinars that RSM is hosting at the moment. Um, we will be um, hosting a webinar with the Office of Tax Simplification, OTS, uh, about the future of IHT and CGT on the 15th of July. Uh, and for those of you that are, you know, uh, in touch on social media, um, please do find us on LinkedIn, RSM's VAT Group. Um, we will be posting regularly with our thoughts on the latest developments uh, if you can't wait for the next VAT webinar on the 23rd of September. Um, so I think that's all we've got time for today. In fact, probably uh, we've run over on a little bit. Uh, I really appreciate your attention today. Um, and I'm sure that Ian and Sarah uh, will join me in uh, saying that we hope you found it useful and we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Take care.